Hello, and welcome to the Think JSA webinar series brought to you by the Office for Strategic Engagement. Today, we are pleased to present a distinguished speaker. This session is unclassified and will be recorded and posted to the JSAO network. Please keep in mind that the views and opinions expressed by all participants do not necessarily reflect the views, opinions, or policy of the U.S. government, Department of Defense, or U.S. SOCOM. If you have questions after this session, please email thinkjsau at jsau.edu. Hi, uh, I'm Dr. Rob Burrell, and welcome to this special interview from Joint Special Operations University. Today's topic is understanding the current state of Venezuela. I have the honor of interviewing Dr. Craig Deere from National Defense University. I want to emphasize that the views expressed in this interview are entirely the opinions of the participants. They do not represent those of the U.S. government, the Department of Defense, National Defense University, or Joint Special Operations University. Now to our guest today, Dr. Craig Deere. Dr. Deere has served at National Defense University since 2001. He pre previously served in the U.S. Army for 20 years. He is an American political scientist with a PhD from John Hopkins University. He specializes in the Western Hemisphere and particularly in Latin America. His most recent book is A Tale of Two Eagles, U.S.-Mexico Defense Relations Post-Cold War. We are privileged to have him here today to discuss the state of Venezuela. Craig, thank you for joining us. Rob, good morning. Thanks, uh, thanks for the invitation. Awesome. Um, please tell us a little bit about yourself and how Latin America became the focus of your research and that scholarship. Sure. Well, the um, the one thing that, that wouldn't show up in, in my bio is that uh, uh, my dad retired from the Air Force. Uh, we moved to Guadalajara, Mexico when I was 12. So I grew up in Mexico. Uh, to include the last four years going to an all-male Jesuit prep school. And one can imagine those formative years, the influence, the impact that it has on you. And that has stayed with me ever since. That is likely why I gravitated to become a, a Latin American fail. And just by sheer luck, I was actually on orders to go to be a, an A-Arma down in Argentina, but somebody left early, something happened, and they said, how, how about Mexico? And I said, uh, sure, I'll, I'll do Mexico. So that took me back to Mexico in the early 90s and has, uh, even though I am or was technically a Latin American specialist, I was really mostly a, a Mexican specialist. And when I retired from the army at the end of 2000, I joined it was then called the Center for Hemispheric Defense Studies, now known as the Perry Center, which, which broadened me a little bit. Uh, so I had the opportunity to go to virtually every country, Latin American country in the region, curiously enough, with the sole exception of Venezuela. Um, so so my, my knowledge of, of Venezuela is, is staying abreast of the literature, right? not, uh, not from any on the ground experience. Although I visited her neighbors, you know, spent a lot of time in Colombia, some time in Brazil, some time in Guyana. Uh, so hopefully uh, a combination of those things will, will be helpful for, for our purposes today. That's great. I, uh, I love that background into um, spending your childhood um, in Mexico because all of us, I think, as humans have, um, you know, these dominating features in, in the way we view the world based upon where we grew up. And so that's, that's really interesting insight about you. Um, so let's talk up a little bit about Venezuela in terms of um, the regional uh, instability uh, down there. You know, most of us in the United States are not very educated on what exactly is happening uh, in Venezuela. So what is going on in the region and what are some of the dominating factors of instability? How much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> so I say that obviously in jest, but but my view is that that the drivers of of insecurity and instability in the region are deeply rooted in the region's colonial past. You know, how the region was colonized, who the colonizers were, when it was colonized, 
So as opposed to the North American experiment, not including Mexico, obviously, but US and Canada, uh, that happened you know, beginning in the 17th century, but really mostly in the 18th century. Whereas farther south, that began in the late 16th uh, and early 17th centuries. And, and the predominant uh, political formation in, in Iberia, of course, was, was feudalism. And you still had monarchies and the predominant economic uh, paradigm was mercantilism. So all of that gets imposed on an indigenous population. And, and so what we see over the course of the next three, 400 years, are, are efforts to try and evolve politically and economically and socially and, and develop meaningful and effective judicial systems, but, but it's a work in progress. And, and so my argument is that um, high levels of insecurity that we see in most countries in the region with a few exceptions that you can count on one hand and have fingers left over are the result of immature political systems, um, weak economies, um, weak to non-existent systems of justice. And all of these are due to uh, the cultural imprint that, uh, that began hundreds of years ago. So, so what we have seen certainly in the 20th century, and it continues into the 21st century, is that um, the, the societies in all these countries are, are struggling to improve their lot, but their political systems um, largely favor uh, the strong man, right? The caudillo, the cacique, uh, depending on the country. And so heavily presidentialist systems, um, high levels of, of corruption are the norm, high levels of impunity, which, which makes it difficult to, to advance economically and politically, which op opens opportunities for illegal activity. And so if, and starting from Mexico and going all the way south, we see, we see this form of, of political and economic behavior that, that is the norm rather than the exception. And Venezuela uh, currently, going back to or most recently, uh, the Chavez uh, period uh, is, is that in spades, right? It is, it is evolved from a, from a highly, uh, from a, a country with, that is highly dependent on, on the oil sector um, to now being essentially, as Mo Moises Naim would characterize it, a criminal state. And, uh, and of course, they're, they're assisted by, in the region, primarily by Cuba and Cuba's disciples, um, to include Nicaragua, Ecuador at times, Bolivia at times, Argentina at times, et cetera, et cetera. Let me, let me stop there. I could, I could go on, but but hopefully that kind of paints the broad picture. Great, that's awesome. Let me ask you an equally uh, complex uh, question. So uh, tell us about the people of Venezuela, the human terrain, you know, who are those people? You know, what's the ethnic diversity? Um, what's their religious um, um, outlook? Do they have political ideologies? You know, the, the revolution spirit down there or other things? Um, are there social classes? Can you, can you kind of, Describe all that to us so we can get a picture of what the human brain looks like. Sure. So let's go back a little bit um, to say that, uh, again, when, when Gran Colombia was, was colonized and you had what is now Venezuela, Colombia, and Ecuador as part of one, one country or one you know, vice royalty way back when, you had, again, indigenous peoples uh, and and largely Spanish uh, influence, uh, of course. During during the slave period, um, uh, slaves from Africa were imported, uh, and so what you have now is largely a, 
a, a mestizo sort of mix that is ranges from lighter skinned all the way to black. And, and this is what made Chavez so, so popular. Um, his skin tone was darker and, and that combined with his, his true socialist zeal um, made him you know, a very attractive candidate to, to the large, un, poor, and uh, and and you know, in extreme poverty, and then other uh, lower middle class uh, parts of the population. So, so we we this is this is the the foundation, and and for much of its history, until the early. 20th century when they discover oil, it was largely an agri largely an agricultural company with again the, the strong men, either a, a civilian authoritarian or a military dictatorship. And that sort of pendulum would, would go back and forth. Um, in terms of religion, it's highly Catholic. We see less um, less evangelical Protestantism there than we do in, in Central America or even in Brazil. That continues it, in, in other words, the, the strong Catholic um, faith continues with, with marginal um, increases in, in Protestantism. Um, classes, sure. So, and again, this is one of the, the common traits uh, that we see across the region is our levels of, of inequality, right? So you have a, a very wealthy upper class, light skin tone, spend their weekends in Miami, and then a large underclass. And so it's it's not there we don't see ethnic divisions so much as we see uh socioeconomic divisions. And and that's why despite you know we we see Chavez attempt a coup initially back in 92, but when he runs in 98, um, he wins with, uh, with a significant uh, majority, a healthy majority, um, because he is promising that large underclass uh, improvements in their, in their living standards. I should, I should note sort of, um, it's funny to, to recognize that that uh, the Batista regime had imprisoned uh, Fidel Castro back in the day and let him out after two years. We know what happened there. And of course, they, uh, they imprisoned Chavez, but they let him out after two years. So maybe with, uh, with a charismatic populist uh, leaning uh, uh, figure, maybe keep him in jail until they're not quite as, as vital. That's great. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of examples of that in, in Europe. Um, there's one particular one in, in Germany. Um, so um, let's talk a little bit about the diaspora. Um, there are so many Venezuelans uh, fleeing the country. We had, you know, Venezuela was like the economic gold standard powerhouse uh, of South America. And now it's, I think, rated as the poorest uh, in South America. Um, you know the the diaspora, the folks that are leaving, could be up to thirty percent of the population, like seven million people. Um, so, what's driving this? Is it just the economic issues, or are there human rights issues that are that are causing such migration away? Sure, a little bit of all of the above. Um, we've reached that seven point one, according to the latest UN HCR figures, but it's important to recognize that that we started to see somewhat of a diaspora, somewhat of a brain drain in the early 2000s when, especially after Chavez um, fires half of the oil industry and, and, and starts to treat it much more politically. In other words, in having technical leadership, he puts in political leader, leadership that are loyal to him. And that's when we start to see production numbers decline. So there's a brain drain that happens. Um, oil engineers and people associated with that start to leave. They go north and south. Um, and so that was largely, I would say, economic. Uh, 
but uh, but then in the wake of, of Chavez's death in 13 and Maduro's um, rise to power based on Chavez identifying him as his successor and, and Maduro's incompetence and increasingly uh, brutal enforcement of, of security standards, um, the economy declines even farther but but it's not just uh, economic decline; it is increasing levels of insecurity and increasingly uh, violent efforts by by the, the state and a, a newly formed militia. Um, and this had started under under Chavez. Chavez gives the um, he changes the the regulations to say that citizens can't own weapons. He changes that and empowers a, a Bolivarian militia who are or beholden for, for economic reasons to, to the regime who increase um, levels of, of violence uh, just um, disproportionately. And so a combination of, of economic tragedy, I mean, we see inflation spike at million percent or whatever word, uh, Bolivar becomes essentially worthless. Um, we've all read the stories about how you know the average Venezuelan lost 20 pounds over over the course of a few years just because there was little food to eat. This is when Maduro is trying to maintain uh, his economic model, and so people are fleeing to find something to eat and to avoid. Um, being repressed. I, I read a statistic that between 2016 and 19, this is according to Human Rights Watch, over 19,000 Venezuelans were killed, um, both by um, the, the armed forces, the police, and these, uh, this, the colectivos, and the, uh, and the militia. Wow. Wow, that's, that's terrible. So, um, you know, we, the U.S. is is pretty close. Um, you know, I'm, I'm broadcasting here from Tampa. We're pretty close to <laughs> Venezuela. So, what what's U.S. foreign policy um, been towards Venezuela, just in general? And then, how did that develop? And then, are there any nuances that we should understand between, you know, the Trump administration's approach to Venezuela and kind of what the approach that Biden's taken over the last couple of years? Sure. Yeah, the last part is important, but let me let me build the context first. So again, going back to into history, um, Monroe Doctrine, but the classic Monroe Doctrine as is, is conceived by John Quincy Adams wasn't that, uh, that the US was going to impose its will on the region, but rather it was a message to Europe and to Russia to say, hey, this is not your hemisphere. This is a hemisphere of free people, leave us alone. And the U.S. wasn't heavily involved in Venezuela until the discovery of oil in the early 20th century. And despite the fact that there were authoritarian leaders uh, in various phases of the, the 1920s, 30s, 40s, even up to the 50s, the U U.S. was tolerant of those regimes, despite human rights abuses, et cetera. Um, we were a supportive of of the the oil that that, uh, that was necessary, and of course World War II we we rely on that oil, and post World War, um, it's the bi it's the bipolar world and the fear of Soviet ideological and geopolitical expansion. So again, despite the fact that there are military regimes controlling the country, we are supportive. In the early 60s, this is where Fidel starts to come in. Um, where he's try, trying to export folkismo throughout the region. The, the military leadership was staunchly anti-communist. And so a, 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 we see an even stronger development of, of a bilateral defense, a bilateral mill-to-mill -mill relationship uh, begin. And at one point, uh, 
I think it's fair to say that it was the strongest mill-to-mill -mill relationship that the U.S. had in the region, so much so that, um, that the U.S. authorized the sale uh, during the Carter administration, who had, you know, Carter had prohibited the sale of, of probably third-generation fighter aircraft to the region to ensure, to attempt to, to quell any, any arms race. Uh, but he, he allowed the Venezuelans to buy uh, F-16s. And so um, the Air Force relationship was very strong. The very first UNITAS exercise was held in Venezuelan waters. So, so U.S. foreign policy broadly is, has a, a strong relationship with Venezuela, and the mill-to-mill -mill relationship is exceptionally strong. And that continues. I mean, the mill group famously had, had its office space within the Venezuelan military headquarters, right? And that continues until Chavez arrives. And, uh, and so it's, it's clear to see what the watershed event is that, that starts to weaken uh, that very strong relationship and it's Chavez's arrival on scene um, and not just his internal domestic uh, priorities, which were to redistribute wealth. And we can talk about that and there are arguments about that but he was also very virulently anti-US, um, both his own personal views on that, as well as his, his mentor and his idol, Fidel. And so the, the Fidel, Fidel Chavez relationship begins in 94 when Chavez is released from prison, but you know, Chavez is just another blowhard, if you will, but when he's elected president in late 98, and assumes the presidency in 99, then that's when it starts to, to strengthen. I should note that, uh, that when uh, Fidel comes to power in, in the early 60s, uh, one of the places he goes and attempts to achieve a, a strong economic relationship based on oil, you know, he's, he's dependent on the Soviet Union, but he wants to, to broaden that. And, uh, and the Venezuelan government says, uh, no, I don't think so. And they're just, and probably in part because, you know, Fidel's exporting uh, his, his revolutionary thought to the country, attempting to destabilize it. So they say, no, thanks. Anyway, so fast forward to, to the early 2000s. And here's, you know, it's, uh, it's Fidel's dream come true. I've got access to Venezuelan oil. And and that's the economic piece that we can talk about in a second. But but Chavez continues to um, to antagonize the you know he kicks out the DEA um, at the free trade or the Americas and Mar del Plata in 2004, I believe, when President Bush goes down. Uh, Chavez generates this massive uprising against him. He famously goes to the UN and says the devil was here. You know, it smells like sulfur. Um, just really, really strong anti-American um, rhetoric. And so obviously the, the broader relationship cools, the mill, mill relationship essentially disappears. And, um, and so the Trump administration, let me back up just one second. So the Obama administration is trying to, um, to work out some sort of political arrangement where free and fair elections can take place. Um, and and the, the, I guess, undersecretary of state at the time, Tom Shannon, who interestingly enough had been his first assign, his first gig at state was he was the Venezuela desk officer. So the senior guy in the State Department who, cared, who knew more about Venezuela than anybody else and cared more about Venezuela than anybody else was not just the assistant secretary for Western Hemisphere Affairs, but the deputy secretary of state. So he owned that, and he was convinced that that as a good diplomat, you know, state and, and defense have different views on, on how to solve these things. He said, it's got to be through negotiations. The Pope gets involved, but none of this is working, right? There's talk, there's talk, there's talk, but nothing happens. Trump administration comes in, and that's when we start to see economic sanctions again. And of course, the famous 
John Bolton uh, yellow legal pad. What was it? Five K or yeah, five K. Obviously, for effect, uh, no one in the Pentagon had any interest or desire to intervene militarily, at least conventionally. Um, and and so the Trump administration tries, but I think with insufficient creativity, none of that was successful. The Biden administration comes in with a, a different view, even though some of the, they've maintained um, many of the sanctions against individuals. Um, as we know, perhaps uh, as a result of the, uh, the elections in, in Colombia where, where Petro wins, in March, the US sends a delegation uh, down to, to begin negotiations. Obviously, uh, Ukraine is a factor as well, um, Russian oil exports, et cetera. And so you have, you have this administration uh, attempting a different approach to, to begin to reestablish a more, what they would argue, a more effective means of communication and, and movement towards um, a political solution. Um, there are though, the counter to that is Maduro's never gonna give up. Why would he? between the, the Cuban intelligence and military influence to say nothing of the Chinese and the Russians, why would, why would Maduro feel inclined to, to go for that? But the opposition uh, appears to be tired. You know, it's from the, from the heyday of Guaido uh, assuming the, the presidency or self-declaring himself the interim president receiving support from the US and another 50 countries. Um, but that that hasn't been successful. And despite all the economic sanctions, Maduro has found a way to evade them through reliance on primarily China and Russia, Turkey, of course, Iran to a degree, and, and the use of, of cryptocurrencies, the selling of illegal, illegally mined gold, um, illegally um, forested timber. I mean, it's it's a criminal state. And so the Biden administration recognizes that, but I guess it's, it's not too different from the Obama administration saying, look, uh, we, we've tried this policy for 50 years, 50 years plus with, uh, with Cuba, it hasn't worked. Let's try a diplomatic offensive, even though the timeline has been much shorter with with Venezuela, um, the Biden administration, with with a number of people who served in the Obama administration, uh, obviously um, have have that sort of um, foreign policy viewpoint of attempting to do more diplomatically. So that's I think where we are right now. And it, well, and I should say, of course, um, giving giving Chevron the uh, the authority to begin to. Uh, to return you know, after they left in 2007, 2008, Chevron and, and Exxon uh, giving uh, Chevron the ability to, to start oil production again. Right, that was just last month in November. It's uh, crazy. Um, it, it does seem like things are softening a little bit. So you, you've talked, we've talked around the edges around Nicolas Maduro. Um, so, you know, if you could give us a little bit more on, on him, he seems like a controversial figure um, not only abroad, but but maybe he's not the strongest dictator at home. You know, maybe he has some soft spots that um, there's folks within uh, his own party or folks in the region who, who may think of him as temporary uh, or maybe not uh, there for the long term. So um, how did he come to power? How did he become Chavez's successor? Um, what's his ideology and, and what's his strength of support at home? Right. So... So Maduro is, I think, it's safe to say, you know, not the sharpest knife in the drawer. Um, was a, a a taxi driver, a bus driver, was a member of of that union, and a a very strong supporter of of Hugo Chavez. And over the years, during Chavez's rule, 
grew in in uh, in leadership roles within the union and came to Chavez's attention. And I suspect, and I I have nothing to base this on other than just looking at the evidence, um, is that Chavez picked him not because he was the smartest guy, but that he was the most loyal guy and that he would do exactly what Chavez said. And when Chavez was dying and designated him as his uh, heir apparent, he was also convinced that if he told Maduro to do exactly what Raul, or I guess Fidel and Raul and the Cuban leadership said, he would do that to maintain the revolution alive, right? The, the Venezuelan you know, 21st century socialism is built upon the, the Cuban revolutionary model. And so that's the playbook. So do whatever they tell you. And he has complied. Now, um, there have been attempts to unseat him, but because you know, my, my hypothesis is that again, this when 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 Ulu came came along and was you know enamored with Fidel, this was this was Cuba's salvation. Um, you know, the the fifty three thousand barrels of oil a day at you know very favorable market rates to not say almost free. Incidentally, I mean, you know, a gallon of gas in Venezuela today costs two cents, right? So it's heavily up subsidized, it's given away. And so, so Cuba, the Cuban leadership, heavily influenced by the Cuban military, of course, is um, they are not going to let this go easily. And even though Cuba continues to weaken economically, um, they have got their hooks in very deep to Maduro. His his security uh, is is ensured primarily by Cuban intelligence services, Cuban military forces, and and so they are the ones Cuban counterintelligence to ensure that any that, that they are are tracking any potential dissent, any potential coup attempts. And so it's not the strength of Maduro and his political acumen that are keeping him in power. It is rather uh, Cuban intelligence services, uh, as well as elements of the Wagner Group and others that have, you know, there, there are concentric circles around Maduro to make sure that he is protected. You're really describing Cuba as almost like the center of gravity to M Maduro's uh, strength. I would say so. In fact, I wrote a piece for America's Quarterly several years ago that said the solution to Venezuela runs through Cuba. And it would require a, a I think, a very thoughtful campaign um, coordinated by the NSC, but with presidential approval to figure out how, how to do that. But for certainly that wasn't going to happen during the Trump administration for domestic political purposes, right? In the Trump administration with, with Florida, et cetera. But even, even today, uh, I, haven't, I haven't seen much of that, but, but my, I, I'm willing to hold on to my hypothesis that you can, you can, you can attempt to do whatever you want in Venezuela, but but Cuba will is the key. I think center of gravity is is the right term. Oh, great! Oh, that's that's very interesting. Um, so uh, we really didn't talk about a lot of strong strong uh, strength of support at home for Maduro. Um, well, let, let, let me let me mention that real briefly. Um, that begins to take place back when Chavez is in power. Again, so the US-Venezuela military relationship is solid. They're, they're professional. Um, and, and so when one of the 
the, the counter coups against, against Chavez takes place in 2002, if I'm not mistaken, with the involvement of the Venezuelan military and the Venezuelan business sector. And Chavez survives with help from Cuba. And so after that, he's like, okay, I gotta fix this. So he begins to politicize the, the Venezuelan military. He, he purges the senior leadership who have all been trained in the US and by the US, purges them, um, promotes those that he believes are ideologically loyal to him, and he starts to buy them. You know, this is when, when uh, oil prices are above $100, $100, so the money is there. In addition to Petro Caribe and buying boats in the Caribbean and, and in Latin America with, with oil, he's able to corrupt uh, the, the, the Venezuelan military. So that's when it begins and that continues, right? So the, the major uh, drug trafficking and, and TCO really in, in the country is the Cartel de los Soles, right? The Soles meaning the rank on the, on the uniform. Uh, the, the Venezuelan military runs that cartel. And so it's, it is completely illegitimate, but it's loyal. And he has bought that loyalty. He, Chavez, and Maduro inherits that. So, so this is among the reasons why um, during the heyday, when Chavez was able to, to redistribute uh, a great and give away, frankly, all sorts of uh, uh, goods and services to the lower class, Maduro is increasingly or decreasingly able to do that because he needs to maintain those monies going to uh, the military, the intelligence services, the colectivos, etc. And there's just less to go around. Um, so that's that's his base of support, but it's not it's not ideological. In some cases, of course, it is, but primarily it's bot. Okay, great. No, that's great insight. Um, so interesting. So um, there seems to be a lot of obviously resistance to uh, Maduro. Um, one from the diaspora, but also inside the country, um, there's been a lot of protests, really colorful video, and um, the active protest movements, um, some of which seem to be underground, so we don't know a lot about them, seem to be very well organized. Um, so, our, you know, there's been violent clashes in, in Caracas. Um, you know, is there one resistance movement here, or are there many? And and how how what's what's that uh, landscape look like? Yeah, that's the the problem that Venezuela has has suffered. Uh, the society, I would say, has suffered for the last twenty years plus, is a is a fragmented opposition. They've been unable to coalesce around any particular leader, and it's it's clearly a shortcoming. Um, there are egos involved, obviously the former mayor, Guaido, Capriles, et cetera, and others, a newer generation, are all vying to be the leader of this opposition. And, and so what the net result of that is that Maduro doesn't have a, a unified front to worry about. Um, and there are um, individual resistance movements from either students or workers um, curiously enough, my hypothesis is that, well, let me back up just a second. So, so inflation spikes in 2019 at millions of percent, you know, wheelbarrows, it just, you know, there's not enough money. Um, but, but more recently, Maduro has, has de facto, if not de jure, uh, dollarized the economy. So, so goods and services, uh, Food has returned to the shelves and people are able to, they're in a little bit better shape. What that means is that you, you have enough to eat and have enough nutrition to actually protest against the regime. For years, you know, if you had enough money and or strength, you walked away and, and those that couldn't just kind of survived as they could. Um, 
And so what, what appears to be the case from the opposition, the opposition had, appears to have come to the conclusion that despite their best hopes, you know, th that the regime would fall, that there would not be enough economic uh, support um, externally, et cetera, for Maduro to survive, that the regime would fall and then the opposition would take over and we'd begin the rebuilding process. But, but the height of that weakness has come and gone and, and the regime has managed to settle into this new normal of being able to have sufficient money, again, through illegal activities to survive. And they don't, the opposition sees no other way than, okay, I guess we're going to have to try a political, a political um, approach. And, and so that's why the new push by the Biden administration for, for elections isn't exclusively coming from the states. It's coming in part from what the opposition is saying. So if, if you're a critic of the administration and saying, how can you possibly you know, engage with, with this regime? It's illegitimate, um, et cetera, et cetera. All that may be true, but if, if you're not going to have a military uh, attempt at resolving this, and most everybody says that that's, you know, it's not Panama, it's a big country, right? Twice the size of California. <laughs> it's, it's huge. Um, what, what's, the, what's the alternative? And, and so what I suspect will happen is that Maduro will, will acquiesce to elections, but they'll be tainted and he will win again. And so perhaps at that point, and this will take another year or two, right? At that point, the opposition says, hmm, okay, plan A didn't work or plan C, whatever it was going back to 2016, 17, 18. Maybe then they'll, they'll be interested in doing something else. But, and of course, the, a, a different option, a different set it is highly complex and the Biden administration isn't interested in doing that at this point. Uh, so we'll, we'll just have to see. Yeah, uh, this is awesome. So um, you, we've spoken a lot about Venezuela and internally uh, to that country, but there's some, some neighbors that the U.S. has relationships with that are very key here. Uh, Colombia has its own issues with st stability, um, obviously, but... Um, there's also been tensions between Colombia and Venezuela and some fighting on the border, I think. So, you know, what's Colombia's relationship uh, with Venezuela? Is it changing? Uh, what are their interests there? Um, how does that landscape look like today? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a very dynamic situation that is changing as we speak because of Petro's victory, right? So again, going back to history, Colombia was in really bad shape, late 90s, early 2000s. That's what leads to the Uribe uh, election and the beginnings of what we now know as Plan Colombia. And so two four-year terms by Uribe, succeeded by uh, Juan Manuel Santos, who had been Uribe's defense minister, but the, and that's that's a separate conversation. Santos is an interesting guy, had a relationship with both Fidel and uh, Raul. And some would argue, I, I'm on this camp, others disagree with this, but uh, former, uh, the former head of the, the Colombian military general, Carlos Ospina, was a colleague up at NDU for several years. Um, wrote a book that came out several years ago entitled uh, the the Colombian Colombia with the FARC and said it was a military victory but a political defeat and so the the situation in which the FARC guerrillas were 
encouraged and motivated to come to the negotiating table was because they had been defeated militarily. And, and the Colombian government was in a very strong negotiating position. And the argument that General Espina and others make is the Colombian government gave up too much in return for too little to achieve that peace accord. And so the peace accord is reached and it's, it's attempted to be implemented, but, but without great success. And, and we have seen that for years. So although some FARC uh, did turn in their weapons and, and of course assumed um, roles in, in the Congress because of the, the parameters of the agreement, um, what, what they now call the FARC dissidents uh, are still running drugs. They're still, they still have safe haven in, in Venezuela. I should note, again, going back, part of the challenge of this bilateral relationship is during Uribe and Santos and Duque, Duque uh, succeeds Santos. Uh, years ago, Chavez says, they're not terrorists, they're legitimate insurgents and um, we should recognize them as such and gave them operating space within Venezuela to, to train and, and re-equip and refit. So, so that is not well received on the Colombian side Right. We'll fast forward to Petro's victory. A new defense minister who had who had been anti anti Colombian military, um, and who's now the defense minister, um, and and President Petro have have reestablished relations with Maduro and with Venezuela, and so that as you as you suggested, yeah that. That situation is changing bilaterally between Colombia and Venezuela, and obviously that involves the U.S. Because when this isn't causal, but the the bilateral defense relationship with Venezuela begins to to sour in the early two thousands, simultaneously, separately because of Uribe and his leadership, the U.S. Colombian military relationship starts to strengthen and becomes, you know, Colombia at one point becomes really the only military ally that the U.S., formal ally that the U.S. has in the region. You know, the U.S. has got great partnerships in the region, but no declared ally. Arguably Argentina back in the day with, you know, uh, major non-NATO uh, ally status, but, but because of the relationship between the U.S. and Colombia, that's that's an alliance, great relationship, and and now that's in question. Now because of the change in leadership at the presidential level, new uh, new defense minister. The U.S. Uh, has has gone down there at uh, at the highest levels. Well, not the highest levels, but um, but at senior levels to Colombia, to to see what this new normal is going to be, at least during this, this first term of Petro. And, um, and publicly, they're saying, you know, we continue to work on things of mutual interest, such as human rights and counter narcotics. But, but behind closed doors, I'm, I'm concerned because, because Petro just has a different view, a former um, former guerrilla himself, and and just has different views of of how to what to do about narcotics. You know, do we even need we the Colombians even need to to battle against narcotics anymore? It's a uh, it's an interesting time to just to put it mildly. That's that's very insightful. So um, along that border, uh, and we talked about Colombia and the park. We talked about the park a little bit. You know, what's happened, it seems like part of the FARC is fragmented and become like a mafia uh, in that in that region, kind of operating along the creases between the two countries. So, you know, is, is that FARC? Is it not FARC? Is it some new organization that sprung up there? And, and what's its relationship with Maduro? Yeah, so so we need to, to recognize that the FARC evolved from being a an ideologically driven 
you know, Maoist Marxist um, <clears throat> group in the in the seventies, eighties, nineties into primarily an economically motivated transnational criminal organization with a facade <clears throat> of of insurgency, but really a TCO. And so I think largely, um, well, it's difficult to know who, you know, if it was the more economically motivated or the more politically motivated individuals who chose to lay down their arms and, and reintegrate into society and those who remain as part of what we now call FARC dissidents. But in any event, your, your term of mafia, well, I'm not sure I would use that term, but it clearly is a transnational criminal organization. And, and going back to the description of how Chavez and then Maduro allowed them to operate there, well, that continues. Again, uh, Venezuela is a criminal state running drugs and other and, and gold and timber and people and anything else that you can move um, through illicit means that is done freely in Venezuela. And, um, and because Venezuela has opened its borders um, and because of the, the length of the border, it's exceedingly challenging for the, the Colombian military to, to disrupt that. And now um, I'm not sure what the new policy is of the Colombian government with regard to to that, I know we we've read reports that uh, the Colombia, Petro has, I'm sorry, has determined that uh, that he will enter into peace negotiations with the ELN. So, um, again, a very highly complex environment. That's great. So the ELN, you know, we talk about the FARC and the ELN, um, both having kind of footprints in both countries. There, you know, what's what's the ELN's relationship in you know with the Maduro regime and how are they operating in and out of there at the moment um, within Venezuela? It's it's uh, it's a an established, yeah. You know, no, nothing signed by the president and and approved by the legislature, but it's a it's a an alliance that allows the ELN to come and go in Colombia at crossing the the Colombia Venezuela border. As they see fit, it's um, it's 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 open, which is why it's a bit concerning um, that that Petro is willing to enter into negotiations. And I say it for this reason: so if <clears throat> if if the Colombian government FARC negotiations weren't as successful as one would have wanted. And that's when FARC was militarily defeated. ELN is, is, is not that weak. And so what is one to expect that uh, will come out of the new negotiations? Um, they are negotiating from a position of strength. It, uh, it's, again, it's concerning. It seems like ELN is kind of a wild card right now. Um, that's that's uh, troubling. So um, there's other folks, uh, external actors um, engaged um, that are not regional or international within Venezuela. You mentioned Hamas. Um, you know what what does uh, Hamas, um, the the Lebanese uh, diaspora in the, in Venezuela, or what is their influence uh, and their interests in in working in Venezuela? So. In fact, I, I had mentioned Hamas. Um, I had mentioned um, Iran. Yeah, that's right. Um, and so, you know, Iran's presence in the region had had primarily been in the tri-border area. And it was largely commercial, a little bit of uh, proselytizing, but mostly commercial. Um, and you know a huge uh, money laundering operation, and, and an attempt to to weaken at the margins to the, the degree they can the legitimate governments in the region. With Venezuela, uh, Iran shares you know they they are similarly sanctioned, uh, 
So they're both in search of opportunities where sort of a, a black market or a market of the of the of the sanction can operate, um, and that's uh, that is absolutely fine for uh, for Russia and China, who are you know <clears throat> attempting to undermine the rule based order, and uh, and so I think Iran's primary role in Turkey's as well is largely economic um, and but the the actors of, of even greater concern are China and Russia China also for economic reasons China has of course whether you're talking about one belt one road or BRI um, they are active globally they're very active other places in the region they have their eye on Venezuelan oil and have invested uh, billions, 40 to 60 billion, no one's quite sure. Um, but because of the inept running of PDVSA, um, they aren't getting a whole lot out of it. I think the current estimates range between 500 and 600,000 barrels a day. In contrast, you know, Russia produces 11 million barrels a day. As do as do we, right? So, but but this is I. My sense is that Venezuela, although they would like that now, they China plays the long game, right? They are perfectly happy to to suffer some short term economic losses, to ensure access to to those resources when they are finally up and running again. Russia's in, interest is is more geopolitical, I would argue. Um, almost like the Cuban Missile Crisis when, um, when we had had assets stationed in, in there near abroad and they wanted to put assets in Cuba. This is, okay, you're, you're, in, you're expanding NATO, et cetera. Okay, well, we're going to try and expand our presence in the region. The largest presence right now are, are of course, Cuba historically since the 60s and then uh, Nicaragua and Venezuela are the strongest recipients of, of, of weapon sales and technical advisors. I mentioned the Wagner Group, they are, they are reported to be in Venezuela uh, offering uh, assistance. So, <clears throat> so these external actors complicate an already complex situation. But if it, if it was just regional actors, it would be challenging enough. But when you involve the world's largest, according to PPP, you know, uh, economic measures or second largest economy, and then a malign actor such as Russia, that gets even that gets even tougher. Yeah, it's getting very complex uh, as we're discussing all these different interests in the in the region. Um, so uh, as, maybe we should wrap up here. Um, but uh, tell me what else uh, you know. I didn't ask you. You know what? What am, what are we missing in regard to Venezuela that's that's key and critical and is something you're looking to is um, as important? Or do you have any recommend recommendations or takeaways from uh, how we approach uh, Venezuela and perhaps come to a um, a good outcome at the end? Yeah, unfortunately, I think based on a generation of of Chavez and Maduro, it's going to take a huge effort to begin to to stop digging and then begin to refill the hole, right? i'm not I'm not convinced that there has been a <clears throat> an effective consideration, as I mentioned uh, a while ago, consideration of using all instruments of national power to see what's what else is possible. So we know how it's supposed to work, right? We're supposed to have a policy goal. And then what are what are the instruments of national power and and what is in the art of the possible? Um, I I thought that there was an opportunity in 2018 and 19 when 
when they appear to be at their weakest, right? Inflation was super high. Look, at the end of the day, the crisis in Venezuela is a political one. There are military aspects to the crisis, but it's primarily political. So the, the net solution will need to be a political solution. But if we can assist in shaping the environment um, so that the opposition is stronger and, and the regime is weaker, uh, I think we should be doing everything we can in that regard. And I'm not convinced that we are. Thank you very much. So, um, Dr. Deere, I want to thank you for sharing your thoughts today about Venezuela. Um, if you'd like to know more about Dr. Deere's mm -hmm. thoughts, I highly recommend his monograph, Latin America 2020, Challenges to U.S. National Security Interests, which discusses many of the Latin American countries, including Venezuela. I'd also like to recommend the podcast State of Venezuela with host Rafael Struve, who has covered so many topics on Venezuela since July 2020. Again, the views expressed in this interview are entirely the opinions of the participants. They don't represent the U.S. government, the Department of Defense, National Defense University, or Joint Special Operations University. I want to thank everyone out there for joining us today, and thank you, Dr. Deere. Thank you, Rob. Appreciate the opportunity, and, and best of luck to, uh, to the folks in your, uh, in your seminar. Thank you very much.